It's true, I was here 20 years ago. I was a postdoc uh, working with uh, Claude. It's such a pleasure to be back and uh, to be back to this wonderful building to get to see many of you we haven't uh, met in person for many years. So I'm, I'm extremely grateful for the conference organizers. I think this conference has been key in enriching and developing the field uh, in Europe. So we are all very grateful for this uh, contribution. Today, I'm going to be talking about efficiency and distributional implications of real-time pricing for electricity. And I'm going to be talking about several papers which are uh, based on joint research with Michael Kahana, Marvel Wands, David Rapson, and uh, G11. Um, Let me start from uh, the need to reduce carbon emissions. And we know uh, that uh, uh, the power sector has one of the greatest potential to contribute uh, to carbon emittance for which uh, a massive deployment of renewable energies is required. But as it is well known, this is faced with a major challenge, which is the fact that renewable energies are intermittent, uh, which implies that at times of high demand and low renewable energy, probably like we are suffering uh, today, there might be a mismatch between supply and demand. For these reasons, economists, uh, for quite some years now, have been entertaining the idea of whether we can uh, reverse the business as usual supply and demand paradigm in electricity markets, which is uh, electricity demand is inelastic, uh, so supply has to follow demand. However, we uh, are considering alternative options so as to enhance demand uh, response, so that with supply being increasingly inelastic due to the increasing weight of renewables, uh, we might uh, hope that demand uh, will respond uh, to prices and therefore contract the intermittency in renewable energy. But it's clear that a necessary condition for this to be the case, a necessary condition to have efficient demand response, is that consumers face uh, prices that reflect the changes in the cost, in the marginal cost of meeting demand, so that they face the right incentives to move demand from high price, high cost hours uh, to uh, low cost, uh, low price hours. The potential benefits of these have been uh, widely studied. So to start with, uh, demand response would provide the flexibility that would facilitate the integration of renewable energy. I might even allow to make use of uh, renewable uh, resources that would otherwise be lost at times when uh, there's a lot of them. At the same time, this would mitigate the need to invest in backup uh, capacity and storage capacity in interconnection capacity. That is, those assets that uh, uh, provide flexibility. But if we manage to have the man flexibility, we can save on all those investments. Furthermore, uh, the man response would allow the market to be more efficient because it would allow to reduce production cost because we would be replacing high cost production with low-cost production. And last but not least, uh, the demand elasticity would allow to mitigate uh, market power. And as you know, the literature on the benefits of dynamic pricing, critical big pricing, or uh, real-time pricing is, is very large. Many of the authors are here in the room. So there's uh, papers uh, trying to measure the demand elasticity, typically in, in experimental uh, settings or in field experiments. Uh, um, documenting the importance of information uh, for demand response, theoretical papers looking at the long-run benefits of real-time pricing, the effects of real-time pricing on market power, on environmental issues, and so on and so forth. The list is very long, so I just uh, recommend you to check uh, this very nice survey by Harding and Sexton. But today, rather than uh, focusing on the benefits of real-time pricing, I'm going to talk about uh, the, the real possibilities of real-time pricing, that is, the limits that uh, we are facing when we want real-time pricing to make a difference. Some of them have to do with, with efficiency. To start with, uh, for consumers to be able to respond to price changes, they need to be informed. They need to be aware that they are facing prices that change uh, hourly, and they need to know these prices. Is this really the case? Furthermore, even if they're informed, they have to face the incentives to change their consumption accordingly. That is, they have to benefit from uh, changing their consumption in response to those price changes. 
what are the true uh, savings that they get uh, by changing their consumption patterns. Furthermore, there might be some uh, equity issues. The most basic one, which is the one that I'm going to be focusing most today, has to do with the fact that under time invariant prices, there are some consumers that are cross-subsidizing the others. Those consumers uh, who consume mostly at peak times are being cross-subsidized by those consumers that consume uh, off-peak. So if we move from time invariant prices to real-time uh, pricing, this cross-subsidization disappears. So if we really want to measure the equity implications or the distributional implications of the switch from time invariant prices to real-time uh, pricing, we have to understand how this cross-subsidization correlates with income. Furthermore, there's other reasons that have to do with the equity concerns that uh, we are clearly facing these days, which is the fact that uh, under extreme events, you know, when there's uh, price shocks like the ones that uh, we are uh, seeing these days, uh, typically low-income households are less prepared uh, to uh, uh, face those extreme events, probably because their houses are less insulated, uh, and so on and so forth. And furthermore, they are less able to invest in equipment to face those shocks. Uh, you can uh, refer to uh, solar, batteries, uh, electric vehicles, uh, and so on. So these issues are clearly very high in the, um, in the media. Uh, during the energy crisis that we are suffering in Europe these days, here this is uh, from the uh, British newspapers that uh, we can find similar headlines in all other European newspapers. This, uh, this is about British households facing fuel poverty as energy prices skyrocket. In this case, this is about some who is facing this dilemma of whether to turn heating up and, and do not eat, or rather uh, turn it down and risk another spell in hospital. Uh, and, and something similar we saw, for instance, uh, in Texas when it was reported that more than 100 people died during winter, uh, most of them from hypothermia during the time of the high extreme uh, Texas uh, prices. So, so it's, it's clear that equity concerns uh, really matter and might have, and they are having an impact on policy. So I would say that the overarching question, I'll be talking about real-time pricing, but something that uh, worries me, and I think it worries many of us in this room, is uh, when we are designing policy, how should we be reconciling the efficiency objectives that we want to pursue and the equity implication of those policies, because the risk is that if we do not address the distributional implications, these equity concerns might undermine the efficient policies, and therefore these policies might uh, never come through. I'll be focusing on real-time pricing, and the experience in Spain, I think, provides a very unique opportunity to study the efficiency and equity implications of real-time pricing. The reason being that uh, in April 2015, Spain became the only country we are aware of in which real-time pricing, hourly real-time pricing, a pure pass-through of the wholesale electricity market prices became the default option for all the households uh, in Spain. So, so here you have a representative uh, day during our sample period. Here are the prices that these households uh, would face, changing across the hours uh, of the day. So the final prices are made of an energy uh, price, which is a pass-through of the wholesale electricity market price, plus a flat uh, access uh, fee. And this has been in place since April 2015. But you know what? Next year, Spain is going to be the first country ever to abandon uh, real-time pricing. And this has been required by the European Commission a couple of weeks ago. And uh, uh, the main reason, I would say, also has to do with the equity implications of real-time pricing, particularly so during the events uh, we are seeing um, these days. In any case, during this time period, access to a very rich data set made of the uh, smart meter hourly electricity consumption of more than 2 million Spanish households. So for each household, we have more than 13,000 uh, data points. This has allowed us to study the efficiency and the distribution implications of the implementation of uh, RTP in Spain as, as, as broadly as it has been the case. So this has allowed us to uh, um, produce these two papers, estimating the elasticity to real-time uh, pricing and the distributional impacts of uh, real-time pricing, uh, which is uh, still uh, a working paper. 
Our work, this research agenda, mainly has four goals. The first one is to estimate the short-run elasticity to real-time uh, uh, prices using the Spanish data. Quantify the distributional impacts of, of real-time pricing and identify the drivers and the mechanisms underlying these distributional uh, impacts and consider some counterfactual uh, experiments to try to understand how these distributional impacts would differ under different uh, scenarios. As I said, we have had access to a very rich uh, data set uh, that was provided to us by one of the largest Spanish utility, which is uh, spread uh, across the country. The sample period we study is made of 18 months from January 2016 to July 2017. This is uh, relevant to the extent that, keep in mind that RTP was introduced a year before, and this is a, this is a time period of relatively uh, low prices, certainly lower than the prices that we are seeing these days. And for each household, we have their hourly electricity consumption. We know the plan characteristics of their electricity contracts, including the type of pricing they are facing, the, something that in Spain is called contracted power, so essentially uh, customers, they have to pay uh, an increasing amount for the maximum electricity they can consume at a given hour. So this is a very good proxy of, of their income, of the size of the households, of the electrical equipment. And we also have the postal codes where they live, which allow us to uh, link this information with detailed uh, census data and obtain some social demographics that are going to be very useful for the uh, analysis of the distributional implications. Let me give you a, a, a first uh, look at the data. So, so this figure is showing uh, hourly uh, prices uh, during the year. These are the, the, um, the gray uh, dots. We also get to see the, the red line, which is the average uh, monthly prices. And we also get to see the annual average price, which is this uh, dark uh, dash uh, line. So, so first thing we see here is that there's substantial price variation. Uh, both within the day and the month, but also across, uh, across months. So typically in Spain, uh, summer uh, has uh, lower, uh, lower prices uh, than winter, and this is also going to be very relevant uh, for the issues that we're going to see uh, later on. For you to have a sense of what this uh, price variation implies, the average difference between the minimum and the maximum price in a day was equal to 23%. Let me first about uh, the price elasticity that uh, we see in the data uh, by showing you the results of our uh, first paper. In this paper, we want to estimate the short-run price elasticity of the month uh, for each of these households. So at the household level, uh, our main um, uh, regression tries to investigate uh, the response of, of hourly electricity consumption on the left-hand side uh, in response uh, to price changes, which are uh, instrumented with national uh, wind uh, forecast, which are pl plausibly excluded from the determinants of uh, household level uh, hourly consumption one day after. We control for uh, seasonal fixed effects, uh, for system-wide hourly electricity demand, and for household-specific uh, characteristics, including uh, local temperature uh, beans uh, by hour. So our parameter of interest here is going to be beta I1, which is the elasticity of household I. So when we get all these elasticities for these two million uh, households and we plot them, this is what we find. So this is the distribution of the household level uh, price uh, elasticities for the households on RTP, as well as for the households that uh, are not on RTP, because when this uh, pricing policy was implemented as a default, some of the households were already outside of the regulated tariffs, and uh, the default didn't apply to them. So we have customers on RTP and customers which were not on RTP. So what do we see out of these uh, distributions? First, both of them are centered around zero, so there's a medium of no response to these short-run uh, price changes, and the two distributions look very much uh, similar to each other. Had there been a, a, a response uh, to price changes, we would have expected to see more uh, density on the negative uh, range. However, we didn't, and we interpret these results as showing that at least in our sample, during our sample period, real-time pricing didn't really engage uh, customers. 
So, so we consider several reasons for why this was the case. We provide some survey evidence showing that a Spanish household, they were not aware of the fact that they were paying real-time prices that were changing uh, by the hour. Furthermore, the price changes that we see in our data set uh, were not known by them. Of course, if you are not aware, you cannot even know whether uh, uh, you know, the, the price levels that you're going to be facing. And even for those customers who were aware of that, because we can check who was uh, checking the app to check those prices, um, even them, uh, they, they didn't respond. So why didn't they respond? Well, we compute the potential savings that uh, customers uh, could get. And because there were narrow price differences, probably the cost of changing consumption exceeded the savings. So um, uh, not disregarding the fact that there might be some uh, irrational inattention, probably a big part of this lack of response, at least among the customers who were aware and informed, has to do with uh, rational inattention. So, uh, of course, this is not the end of the story. Our um, estimates are country-specific, uh, are, are period-specific, but at least they provide some evidence that uh, uh, without automatic devices, at least, uh, um, it's, it's, it's not likely that we see that uh, households respond to short-run uh, price changes. So, so the question is, and this is yet an open question, uh, uh, and luckily we won't be able to study it in the next uh, few years because RTP will no, not be in place. Uh, but uh, the question is whether uh, real-time pricing will uh, engage or would engage households if prices were higher, if there were larger uh, price differences. We yet have not studied the impact on, on the medium run. What would happen, for instance, if with the high penetration of solar, uh, solar or electricity prices affected by solar production are more seasonal and therefore more predictable whether um, households would be more able to really adapt their consumption patterns to these uh, new uh, pricing uh, patterns. These are open questions that are yet to be um, uh, studied and therefore I think uh, there's quite a lot to be done in this field. Having reported, at least in the Spanish case during our sample period, the, the absence of demand response, uh, we want to understand whether, even uh, with inelastic consumers, uh, the switch from time invariant prices to real-time prices implied some sort of distribution implications. And in order to do so, we compute the bills on the counterfactual bills that uh, consumers, each household paid on the real-time prices, and the bills they would have paid under uh, uh, time invariant prices using this annual average that you saw in the, in the previous uh, figure. This, uh, we are looking at really transfers uh, across consumers when we move from real-time pricing to a time invariant uh, annual price. And in order to decompose the effects, we also decompose these, bi bi these bill changes in within month changes and across month changes. The first term in brackets is really telling us what would happen if we switch from uh, monthly uh, flat uh, prices, this red line that you saw in that uh, data figure, to real-time prices, and what would happen if we switch from an annual flat uh, price to a pricing system that would charge uh, uh, constant prices uh, uh, across uh, the months. One of the challenges that we face in our analysis is that we do not observe household level income. So we infer it uh, out from the data by exploiting the richness of our hourly consumption data. In particular, we follow a two-step approach. In the first step, we classify consumers into, into types uh, by looking at their uh, consumption patterns over the day. And then we infer the income distribution of those types by matching the distribution of the types at each of the uh, zip codes and the distribution of income at those uh, zip codes. And, and, and this allows us to estimate uh, income uh, at, the, at the zip code level rather than using the zip code uh, level income distribution, which turns out to be very relevant, as you will see in a minute. So we are going to combine the bill impacts with the inferred distribution of income at the household level in order to assess the distributional impacts of real-time pricing. In particular, we want to understand what is the impact of real-time pricing across income bins. How can this impact be decomposed and what is explaining this impact? What are the main drivers of the effects? And whether within zip code income heterogeneity uh, really matters when studying the distributional impacts of real-time pricing. 
So this is probably the figure that uh, this one and the next one that best summarizes the results of our paper. So what you can see uh, here, we have grouped uh, the households in uh, five national income quantiles, and we compute the bill changes from moving from uh, uh, an annual flat uh, tariff to real-time uh, pricing. Uh, and what we see, this uh, red line in which uh, we are using our infer uh, household level income, what we see is that uh, real-time pricing has a slightly regressive effect because the low-income households see their bills increase, whereas the high-income households have savings uh, when they are switching to um, real-time uh, pricing. What we find is that the impacts of uh, real-time pricing are highly heterogeneous within uh, zip codes because of the uh, income heterogeneity within uh, zip codes, which means that if we uh, run the same analysis using the zip code uh, level, um, uh, income, income level, some of this heterogeneity would be uh, lost and the results uh, would uh, somehow be flatter and uh, reverse, showing that it is very important to capture this income heterogeneity in order to predict the distributional impacts of real-time pricing. Let me show you the next figure that tries to decompose the drivers of these uh, bill uh, effects. And here what I do is that I decompose the bill changes in this within month and across uh, months effects. So uh, remember that the within month effect has to do with the fact that instead of facing consumers with the hourly prices, I'm facing them with the average of the month. If we look at uh, these uh, uh, pale uh, pink uh, bars, which reflect the within month effect, we see that the within month effect is slightly progressive because it allows low income customers to save a little bit where it is costly for the high income customers. However, when we look at the across uh, months effects, that is customers are losing the, the hedge, the price hedge, uh, during uh, uh, winter times, because we are moving from an, from an annual uh, flat rate to rates that reflect the monthly average, we see that this effect is, is, is dominating and it is regressive. Why? Because it allows the high incomes to save a lot, whereas the low income customers have to pay um, higher bills uh, when they lose this, this price uh, hedge. And because the cross months effect is dominating, this is what is explaining that overall the aggregate effect is slightly regressive. So we want to explore the mechanisms that explain why these uh, effects have uh, the signs that I just uh, showed to you. So we explore several mechanisms, including uh, how uh, households' uh, <coughs> consumption patterns differ by income, whether they're explained by appliance ownership and by the location where they uh, live. In order to look at this, uh, to interpret the results that I'm going to show you, it is important for you to see the relationship, the correlation that there exists in Spain between appliance ownership, in particular electric heating and air conditioning and income. And what we see in Spain is that uh, uh, electric heating is, only, uh, is mostly owned by the low income uh, households. So 25% uh, of the low-income households own electric heating as compared to uh, a bit less than 10% by the uh, high-income households. The reason being has to do with where they live. In some locations, there is gas uh, infrastructure. In others, there is not. So in those places where there is no gas infrastructure, typically the rural uh, areas, people do not have access to uh, gas heating, and therefore they have to go for electric heating. And it also has to do with the fact, for instance, that uh, low-income households use a plug-in radiator, which is cheaper than having a central gas he uh, heating system. So this is why we find that uh, it's mainly low-income households that have electric heating, whereas air conditioning is, is flatter across the income distribution, if anything, is slightly higher for the high income uh, uh, customers. And there's quite a lot of heterogeneity across location, and this is going to be important to interpret uh, the impacts that I'm going to show you uh, in a minute. The first mechanism that we explore is whether consumption patterns uh, during the day differ by income levels. So what you see here is across the day, the average hourly consumption of the five uh, income bins. 
So the first thing uh, that we see in this figure is the higher income quantiles, they tend to consume more, but they also tend to consume proportionally more uh, at peak times uh, when prices tend to be higher. And this is the main reason why we see that the within month effect uh, is progressive, because when we move from a flat monthly price to an hourly uh, price, um, uh, it's clearly the high-income households that start uh, paying more. So, so preserving the hourly price uh, signal um, um, might be good in terms of, of demand response, and at the same time, it doesn't create uh, distributional concerns. Let us look at appliance uh, ownership, and what we see here is uh, this same type uh, of consumption patterns during the day uh, for households of the uh, first and fifth uh, income quantile without electric heating and with electric heating. And what do we see from here? We see that uh, appliance ownership creates bigger differences than income, yet conditional on appliance ownership, uh, we see that uh, income uh, matters. And what we find is that households, and this is clearly not surprising with electric heating, consume more during peak hours. And if we look at uh, consumption patterns across the year, uh, as it is expected, they also consume more during um, uh, winter times. So uh, households with electric heating are more exposed uh, to the winter prices that tend to be higher. Let me just uh, mention that we don't see uh, appliance ownership in our data set, but we can infer that out of the richness of their hourly consumption data, trying to see uh, how consumption responds to changes in, in temperature in winter times and, uh, uh, and summer times. So given these patterns, it is not surprising to see if we plot the distribution of the, of the gains and losses from real-time uh, pricing, for instance, what we see is that uh, the biggest losses from real-time pricing are suffer because of the across-month effect for those customers who have uh, electric uh, heating because, as I said before, uh, the, the high peak uh, prices are uh, suffered mainly by those customers who have um, electric heating, and because that happens to be the case that in Spain it is the low-income households that have electric heating, this is why the across-month effect uh, is regressive, and this is what is driving the overall uh, slight regressive effect of real-time pricing in our data set. We also consider several counterfactual experiments. We acknowledge the fact that uh, the distributional impacts in our sample are limited and bounded, because during our uh, sample periods there was uh, a small price variation, uh, and we understand that as we uh, uh, move in, as, as we go forward, there might be uh, in, um, increasing uh, price volatility and higher price levels, as we are seeing these days. So it would be very interesting to uh, redo with our framework the analysis for the current uh, prices to try to understand whether uh, both the efficiency and the distributional implications of real-time pricing uh, change. In any case, what we've done. Um, is to uh, explore several counterfactuals looking at these impacts under a large price uh, shock and an increase in volatility, and also looking at uh, uh, some demand elasticity, which is correlated uh, to income, to see how demand elasticity would uh, uh, change the distributional impacts that we report. Let me start with the large uh, price shock. So, so what we do is uh, we simulate uh, uh, prices. So these are two prices up to the summer of 2021, and then we project several price trajectories with low, medium, and high uh, prices and uh, several uh, volatilities. And with these simulated prices, we uh, recompute the distributional implications of real-time pricing. And this is what we get. On the left-hand side, you had the similar figure we were uh, seeing before with the impacts of these price shocks on the five income quantiles. First thing we see is that the impacts clearly become much more important, and the real-time pricing is still regressive. It's even more so in the sense that the difference between the bill impact on the low-income household uh, and the um, impact on the high-income households is wider um, now. Indeed, if we consider this redistribution effect, which is computed as the difference on the bill impact on the low and the high income households, this, this effect becomes stronger under the high uh, prices scenario. And when we look at the impact of volatility, here you have uh, for a given price scenario the, the impacts uh, for different uh, 
volatility scenarios, we see that volatility is not really what is driving the distributional implication, but it's rather the price level. It's not so much uh, price uh, volatility. Indeed, in our sample, because within uh, the month, the low-income household really benefit from this volatility because they are the ones that are consuming less at peak times. Uh, we find that uh, a slightly more uh, volatility uh, slightly uh, benefits uh, uh, them. What about the month elasticity? Um, our starting assumption, and of course we could do the, 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 the reverse analysis, but our starting uh, assumption uh, is that uh, elasticity is positively correlated uh, with income. Why do we say so? Because typically high-income households, they are better able to adapt uh, through EVs, batteries, solar, automatic devices. They are better able to invest so as to enhance their demand response. So under this assumption, it is not surprising to see that the aggregate impact of, of real-time uh, pricing becomes more regressive because high-income uh, households are better able to benefit from real-time pricing in order to, to save. Indeed, if we look at the within-month effect, the slightly progressive effect that we were finding now disappears because for the high-income households that have the ability to respond to price uh, changes, this within the uh, price volatility um, allows them uh, to save uh, more. So, let me summarize the results that I've just shown you and uh, end this talk with some uh, thoughts as, 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 as we go forward um, um, in, in the future. We have analyzed the distribution implications of real-time uh, pricing in Spain and we have found that in Spain, during our sample period, uh, real-time pricing did not trigger demand response and it was slightly regressive. The impacts uh, are nevertheless uh, quite a small. The real impacts can be decomposed in the within-month effect due to the uh, price variation during the day, and this impact is progressive, meaning that, uh, again, we can preserve uh, the hourly price signal during the day without triggering any type of equity uh, concerns. However, the dominant effect is the across-month uh, effect because the low-income households that uh, uh, have electric heating, they lose the hedge provided by time invariant uh, prices and therefore face higher prices during winter months, which is when they consume more. We do not interpret these results as a general condemnation of real-time pricing as a useful uh, policy tool, among other things, because again, we acknowledge that these results are country-specific and specific to the periods that we study, but this is uh, uh, by construction almost. Different countries, they have different uh, price patterns across the year, within the day, and they have different patterns of appliance ownership. So if in Spain, rather than the low-income households having electric heating, if, if that was the uh, high-income household, some of these effects uh, would be reversed. So I understand that the distribution implications of real-time pricing have to be studied on a case-by-case -case basis. So we see our contribution as providing a framework to assess the efficiency and distribution implications of real-time pricing so as to design dynamic price systems in an efficient and equitable manner. And this is extremely important, I believe, for the future. So what is going to happen in the future? Uh, I can entertain some, some ideas, but uh, what is clear to me is that uh, the impacts, both the efficiency as well as the distributional impacts of real-time pricing, will have much to do with the incentives, uh, sorry, will, will have much to do with the evolution of price patterns in the future, with the evolution of price volatility, as we increase renewables in the energy mix. So what is going to happen with price levels in the future? Probably they are going to go down. But what about uh, price volatility? Well, we can think that uh, within the day, probably price volatility increases as we start having dark curves uh, uh, for uh, uh, prices, something that we are starting to see also in Spain and also in southern uh, France and, pro um, um, sorry, Southern Europe, and probably this within price volatility that has a strong seasonal component enhances uh, saliency of prices and predictability of prices and therefore promotes um, demand response. Uh, but if storage devices get deployed, some of these 
within day press volatility might be a smooth out. So, so, so again, uh, whether in the future we have more demand response in response to the real-time uh, prices very much depends on these uh, developments. Price patterns might not be the same in 2030 as compared to 2050. That is, they really depend on whether in our energy mix we have renewables and gas, or only renewables, or only renewables uh, and storage. And it will also very much depend on the energy mix that we have. So if we have mainly so solar that has a strong seasonal pattern, so those prices will be more predictable, enhancing demand response, as compared to countries in which they mostly have uh, wind, which is uh, less predictable. So if, if we think forward, I understand that, again, the implications in terms of efficiency and the distributional implications will have much to do with the evolution of prices uh, in, in the future, which, again, might be country and time uh, dependent. So going back to my overarching uh, question at the beginning, which is, how can we reconcile the efficiency objectives with the uh, equity uh, concern? I think that uh, we as economists working in this field, I think we have a major challenge, which is how to propose pricing systems that are both efficient uh, and equitable. For me, and I think this is quite intuitive, uh, one necessary condition for real-time pricing to work is that uh, we don't have to be concerned about uh, turning on the washing machine at this time or another one, or the fridge or the air conditioning. It should be done uh, for us through automatic devices. So um, we have deployed the smart meters. We have uh, made them uh, compulsory. Why not uh, providing this as a bundle. I give you the smart meter to meter your consumption. At the same time, I give you the automatic device uh, in order for you to be able to manage um, your consumption. If we are concerned about uh, distribution implications, um, uh, what about uh, allowing them to better adjust uh, to these uh, uh, price uh, shocks through solar, efficiency investments, and so on and so forth, to the low-income households that probably cannot afford making them these investments uh, themselves. And, and regarding the um, coexistence of the price signal together with the price uh, hedges, why not consider some, some type of time invariant uh, prices for some exogenous representative low profiles that uh, might be uh, different for, in for different income bins, but yet uh, expose those uh, customers to short-run prices whenever they depart uh, from these um, uh, uh, profiles. Again, these, these are open questions. I cannot provide a final answer. I just think that uh, as a profession, it's important that we think about these issues because, um, again, I think that addressing the distributional concerns is uh, clearly a necessary, not sufficient condition for efficient uh, policymaking. Thank you so much.